a continuation of my previous lecture, Complications of Otitis Media Part 2. I would like to add some additional points. I thank my teacher, Dr. Sadhir Sir, who is the professor and head of the Department of ENT, Government Medical College, Trivandrum. From his vast clinical experience, Sir gave me some additional points which I would like to share. I told in the previous lecture that the six intracranial complications of otitis media can be classified as septic complications and other complications. The septic complications include the meningitis, the extradural abscess, the subdural abscess and the brain abscess. And the lateral sinus thrombophlebitis and otitis hydrocephalus forms the other two complications. But uh, this classification is given in the 8th edition of Scott Brown. But uh, when we think, uh, actually Sar pointed out that uh, that they fought in that uh, classification. That is, uh, in lateral sinus thrombophlebitis, there is actually abscess formation. And also this fever spikes in lateral sinus thrombophlebitis is due to release, release of the septic emboli into the bloodstream. So naturally when we think like that, we have to include lateral sinus thrombophlebitis also under this septic complication. So that is the one is important point that is highlighted. Then the extradural abscess may present a deep seated earache. Brain abscess may, pres may uh, present with bradycardia. Uh, these uh, points I missed in my uh, lecture which uh, Sir ri rightly pointed out. Then among the six uh, intra uh, cranial complications of otitis media, the lateral sinus thrombophlebitis is very important because it is uh, repeatedly asked for the examination. So, sir uh, advised me to uh, systematically present uh, once more the lateral sinus thrombophlebitis. So, whenever you are asked about lateral sinus thrombophlebitis, uh, you uh, write in the following pattern. That is the definition, <laughs> the root of spread, uh, etiology, the stages, clinical feature, that is the symptom sign, the investigation, the treatment and the complication. So, definition, lateral sinus thrombophlebitis is the inflammation of the inner wall of the sigmoid sinus with formation of intrasinus thrombus which usually occur as a complication of acute mastoiditis. Now, the root of spread that, root of spread, that is from the mastoid air cells, how the disease process reach the sigmoid sinus. There are two roots, root of spread. One is either by the direct bone erosion and the second root is via venous thrombophlebitis. Now the etiology, etiology the, um, he, the common uh, pathogens include hemolytic streptococcus, pneumococcus, staphylococcus, pseudomonas, E. coli etc. Now the stages I already uh, described in detail in the previous uh, class that there are four stages for uh, lateral sinus thrombophlebitis. That is the first stage is the formation of peri sinus abscess. Then the then this next stage is that uh, formation of endo uh, that is endophlebitis and mural thrombus formation. And the third stage is the stage of intra sinus abscess. And the fourth stage is the extension of the thrombus. I had uh, detailed uh, discussed in uh, these four stages in detail in the previous class. Then. Uh, the clinical feature. The clinical feature include the symptoms and sign. Now, the as the classical uh, feature, the classical de description of of the sigma of lateral sinus thrombophlebitis is the picket fence type of fever. Here, this is the picket fence type of fever. The uh, the picket fence, as I told you, it's a wooden fence, wooden fence with uh, made of spray spaced uprights connected by two horizontal rails. It's a symbol of mid middle class domesticity. The graphical representation of the fever uh, resembles like a picket fence. Uh, fever is irregular with many spikes, and, uh, and the spikes may coincide with the release of septic emboli into the bloodstream. And in between the spikes, the patient may be asymptomatic. So that is the um, main uh, symptom. Then uh, other symptoms include headache, uh, anemia, etc. So these th three symptoms you can write. That is picket fence, fever, anemia, headache, uh, emaciation, etc. Now the signs. So 
what are the signs see uh, the the sigmoid sinus continues with the mastoid emissary vein so when the thrombus uh, the thrombus when the thrombus occludes the mastoid emissary vein uh, it will cause engorgement of the superficial veins and uh, and it may present as uh, edema over the posterior part of the mastoid so, so that is the grisinger sign so that is a uh, grisinger sign so the uh, another other signs include the i had already uh, described in the uh, previous class that is the toby ir test the crowbeck test etc and the full name of the crowbeck test is the lilly crowbeck test thanks to sadhish sir for this information so what is uh, uh, what is the lilly crowbeck test that is this is the uh, we know that the sigmoid sinus continues with the internal jugular vein so suppose uh, 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 this is the thrombus so the uh, if this thrombus this this thrombus impedes the venous return to the internal jugular vein and it may and it may lead to increased intracranial tension so in in lilly crowbeck test when we apply pressure on the pressure of the internal pressure on the internal jugular vein on the healthy side it produces engorgement of the rectilineal veins which we visualize by using an ophthalmoscope and this engorgement subsides on release of pressure but in the affected side there is already a block here so even if we apply pressure on the internal jugular vein and release we cannot make out any difference so that is the lilly crowbeck test the another test is the toby ir test that is which is similar to crowbeck test that is when we apply pressure on the internal jugular vein on the healthy side the cs of pressure will increase and we are monitoring that cs of pressure by using a manometer but if we apply pressure on the internal jugular vein on the affected side there is no rise in the cs of pressure because already there is a block so these are the signs uh, then papillary edema may be there then the tenderness may be present along the jugular vein if the thrombus extends along the jugular vein so the signs of lateral sinus thrombophlebitis once again the grisinger sign papillary edema the lilly crowbeck test the toby ir test then the tenderness along the jugular vein you can write all this then the investigation i had already described in detail in the previous class the classical uh, contrast enhanced ct brain uh, will show an empty delta sign a filling defect and also the mri may also show the same feature then the um, treatment the treatment include iv antibiotics followed by mastoidectomy so i told in the previous class that there is some controversy regarding to what extent the surgery should proceed that is whether you have to really open the sinus after clearing the disease from the mastoid or just do a mastoidectomy and stop without with a uh, stop with it without opening the sinus but uh, sir advised me that uh, whenever uh, we think that there is a clot there is a thrombus inside the sigmoid sinus definitely the sinus should be opened and the clot should be removed otherwise the clot may uh, lead to it may lead to embolism so always uh, you can tell like that that is uh, remove the bone open the sinus and remove the clot the controversy in the treatment of lateral sinus thrombophlebitis is regarding whether we have to anticoagulate the patient that is in case of thrombus whether we have to start anticoagulants like low molecular weight heparin but otherwise uh, the surgical the surgical steps include the opening of the uh, sinus and removal of the clot now the complications as i uh, told in the previous class that is septicemia meningitis cerebellar abscess etc so this is the uh, systematic way uh, in presenting that is the in writing the lateral sinus thrombophlebitis thank you